Praise the Lord, everyone. I am glad to be in the house of God this morning, aren't you? Amen, amen. Uh, you know, the last few days I've been at home, and the boys and I would go outside. They would play. I would do some work, and I would step outside. And, you know, living next door to the church, I see the one church van in the top parking lot, and the bottom parking lot's full. And I look over here, and it's like, there's absolutely nobody here. And there's a lot of ladies missing. I can't wait for them to come home. But praise the Lord, our ladies are back from ladies' conference. And from what I have been told, this was an absolutely amazing conference. Uh, I've heard some people have gotten a hold, or I say people have gotten a hold of God. God's gotten a hold of some people and refused to let go. And I love, love, love hearing that. Um, You know, uh, when we get to worship service a little bit later on, I'm going to ask if any of you ladies want to get up and testify. I know at least one person will, Sister Granger. But anybody else will have an opportunity as well. I'm not going to make anybody do anything. But uh, I want to give you the opportunity to get up and testify and tell what the Lord has done. And I believe that from what I have heard about Ladies Conference, what you ladies have come back with, and what God laid upon my heart before my wife even got home, what I was preparing to preach for the last couple of days, what God laid upon my heart, I believe that everything was perfectly aligned, what God was doing there in Branson at conference, as well as here as he was speaking to me. And I believe that we've, we're about to see something powerful happen in this church. Amen. If you believe that, somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I believe that God's about to do something big in this church. Amen. Amen. We do have a, uh, a few announcements. Um, coming up next week is the Azalea Parade. Uh, I believe that uh, if you're going to be in the Azalea Parade, you need to make sure to bring some sunblock. Because although it is uh, middle to late spring, uh, the interesting thing about living in the Midwest is it could either be, you know, 30 degrees or 90 degrees. We don't know. And what the Weather Channel says today could very well be wrong. So bring some sunblock. You might also consider a coat. You never know. Uh, But bring some sunblock, and every family, please, uh, we need somebody to, we need everybody to donate a bag of candy, every family to donate a bag of candy to, uh, to this so that we can pass it out on the, uh, on the parade route. When we ask for candy, we're asking for no chocolates, no mints, and no butterscotch. Because these are, well, for one, some of these are things that the, uh, the parade committee will not allow, hard candies, we can't, you know impale somebody and like throw something at them and knock a kid out with a butterscotch. Uh, they, they say that's not nice and I agree with them so let's not do it. And chocolate because you know like I said it could be 30 or it could be 90. Chocolate could end up being hot chocolate and that's not exactly what we're going for. So uh, any of that. Also uh, we need some bottles of water because those of us who are walking uh, again we want to make sure everybody's protected and hydrated. We want to make sure we keep plenty of water so we need some bottles of water. Any donations for that? Make sure to see the Martins um, because they, we, we don't need like you know 37 cases of water and one bag of candy. So please see the Martins about any donations concerning the Azalea Parade uh, plus any work that is going to be done on the float. Uh, coordinate with Sister Martin and Brother Martin to know when and where to be if you want to be involved with that. Also, because next week is Azalea, we will not be having an evening service. We'll just have Sunday morning. Uh, we'll have Sunday school. We'll have Sunday morning worship. And actually between Sunday school and worship somewhere in there, uh, the float and the Sunday school kids that are, I think it's just the float, Sunday school kids won't go yet, but the float and those working on it will be heading over to stage for the parade. Um, but there will be no evening service. Uh, but in, in place of evening service, what we're going to do is we're going to have a barbecue over at my place for everybody involved with the parade. Uh, that'll be, uh, like, it, like I said, Sunday afternoon when we get back, we get everything torn down. We'll have a barbecue over at my house. Uh, in my backyard, we'll have chips, hot dogs, soda, uh, and for those of us who are crazy enough to drink coffee in the hot weather, we'll have coffee too. Praise the Lord. Uh, I see a couple hallelujahs and some amens going on there. That's how I know I pastor the right church. <laughs> um, let's see, what else we got going on? Oh, yes, this coming Friday, Move the Mission Kickoff. That will be over in Perryville at Perry County UPC. Brother Tyler Cummings will be ministering there. He is a great, great youth pastor. He is a powerful man. I expect great things at uh, the Move the Mission kickoff. If you want to go, we will be taking a van. Uh, The students, I believe, if we have enough students, we'll be taking separate vans. Uh, 
more information on that to come. I'll work out all the details with Brother Garrick, and we can talk a little bit more about it this evening. And speaking of this evening, this evening is youth service. Brother Garrick will be ministering to us. I'm excited to have our youth director behind the pulpit to bring the word. Amen. Amen. Now, with everything going on, next week, you know, it's Azalea Festival. We've got Azalea Parade. We've got all kinds of things going on. Uh, I, I misspoke a moment ago. We are not having Sunday school next week. Instead, at 10 a.m., we'll be having muffins with mom. It is our way of celebrating the mothers and the ladies in our lives that have made a big impact, uh, big impact on us, and that will be across the street in the fellowship hall. We will be having uh, muffins with mom. We'll have muffins, coffee, juice. Bring your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, your sister, any special lady in your life. And even if you have nobody to bring, you are invited. I, I want to make that abundantly clear. You are invited because... There, everybody in this church, I'll put it like this. If you have attended this church, there's a lady in this house that has, that has impacted you, I'm sure. Whether it be Sister Sharp, Sister Granger, Sister Martin, Sister Scoffier, or my wife, Sister Courtney, Sister Elise, somebody has impacted you. And you are welcome to come celebrate those special ladies with us. So that will be Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in the place of Sunday school. Um, and that is all that I have as far as announcements for this week. We do have a couple prayer requests. Um, for one, uh, Matthias Odenthal is at home not feeling well this morning. That's where Brother Josh is this morning as well. So we need to lift up Matthias. Also, Levi is at home not feeling well, my son Levi. And um, my son Nathaniel. Put it like this. We, we all know the difficulties and struggles he has with his autism. Sister Granger has said something to me this morning. I agree. We've been praying about it. But you know what? It's time to stop praying. It's time to, it's time to go to war. I'm not playing, and I'm not saying this because it's my son. Anybody who has a hard time coming in the house of God, for whatever reason, it's time to go to war, church. It's time that we make a place where people can come into the house of God without anxiety, without fear, without depression, make a place where people can come and meet Jesus face to face. And if that means if we have to battle a spirit that is oppressing them before they get here, so be it. And my son is one of those. So let's pray that God touches and heals Nathaniel and delivers him from these things that, that, uh, that plague him and bother him so often. Also, Sister Escoffier is home this morning. She is having uh, some, uh, some issues with some pain with her nerves, and she is needing a healing. So let's stand. Let's pray. Let's ask for God's healing upon all those needs and God's anointing upon this morning's, uh, this morning's lesson. Mighty God, we worship you, Jesus. We give you praise and glory above all others because, Lord Jesus, you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords, and we worship you in this house, God. We give you glory and honor, Jesus. We come to you right now, Lord God. We come to you, Lord Jesus, with, with the intent of making this a place that is open for worship, open for people to encounter you. And so, Lord God, as we have to come against spirits, as we have to come against oppressions, as we have to come against illnesses or anything, Lord God, that would prohibit people from worshiping you, freely. God, in the name of Jesus, right now, we take authority and we take dominion over these things, Lord God. We, we speak against this. We prophesy against this. That chains now would be loosed off of people, Lord God. That revelation now would be opened unto people. And Lord God, that you would begin to draw people into this house. Lord, I proclaim power, Lord. I proclaim peace, Lord. I proclaim healing, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord. Every single need that needs healing Lord your word proclaims that it is by your stripes that we are healed so mighty God I stand upon that Lord I call upon that and I believe that as I proclaim it Lord so shall it be in your name God we give you praise and we give you glory Lord God we ask for your anointing in this morning's lesson Lord Jesus that you'd have your way we give you praise and glory in Jesus mighty name we pray amen amen thank you Lord thank you Lord go ahead church give him a hand clap of praise Hallelujah, Jesus. Yoroko Shotorobosata. Hallelujah, mighty God. Hallelujah. You may be seated for a moment of time. I'm going to ask right now if our ushers would come, if one of you gentlemen would uh, give us the handouts for this morning's lesson and the other to receive this morning's offering. Those who want to give online or digitally, we have a couple of methods by which you can do that. Um, you can go to our website, freshanointingupc.org, 
You can click on the giving link there. You can also text the amount of your donation, the amount of your gift to 84321. Yeah, you can set up your online giving there. Amen. Well, without further ado, I say we get into the Word of God. What do you say? Amen, amen. That's why we're here anyways, to hear from God. Well, this morning's lesson is entitled, Beauty from the Broken. And I want to ask, has anybody in here ever felt betrayed? I, I mean, I can look across the sanctuary and pretty much everybody, what I know of your history, I can think of at least one instance in just about everybody where you have been betrayed or felt betrayed at the very least. And, you know, I've... I felt my fair share of betrayal through my life. I felt like, uh, you know, when my parents split up and me and my dad weren't on speaking terms, I, I, I kind of felt a little bit of that, that betrayal in my life then. And if you, were to, if you were to describe the feeling of betrayal, like how it feels, if you had one word to describe betrayal and what that does to you, how would you describe it? Hurt. And why would you choose that word specifically? Because it's painful. It may not cause physical pain, but it causes emotional pain. It causes spiritual pain. Sister Lise, abandoned. Absolutely. Why, why, why do you choose that word? Yes, because you love somebody and they don't love you back the same way. You're absolutely right. You see, one of the biggest hurts that... Uh, And this isn't necessarily part of my lesson this morning. One of the biggest hurts that we are going to encounter as people come to the house of God is betrayal from the church. I've heard it said, and I kind of agree with this, that church hurt is the worst hurt. Because you see, me and my dad, like I've, like I've told you guys many times, we weren't on speaking terms for years when I first moved to Missouri. He and I didn't talk, we didn't get along, uh, but all of that patched up because that's what family does. Family can survive anything. And I, I've been physically injured, I've, uh, you know, I've broken my hand, I've had my knee completely dislocated, I've been in car accidents, not as bad as some, but I mean, I, I've been physically injured too. My body has healed from that. But when you're hurt by somebody or something that is supposed to be ushering in your salvation, that is supposed to be creating an environment of peace and tranquility for you to meet Jesus, there, there's just something about that. You lose trust for the, uh, for the integrity of the individual preaching the Word of God. I mean, how many of you would trust me to ha- have your salvation and have your uh, uh, spiritual well-being at the forefront of my mind if all I ever did was talk about you and backstab you and ridicule you and tell you how awful you are, you wouldn't trust me to, with your salvation. You wouldn't trust me with your soul, right? We're going to encounter people who have experienced things such as that as they come into the house of God. And it is critical that we understand that this feeling of betrayal, it's universal. And the, as long as it took you to overcome, if you have even been able to overcome your own betrayal, it will take them equally as long. Our text this morning, we, we've got a couple, uh, a couple focus verses. The, the entirety of the text comes from Genesis 45, 46, 47, and 50. I'm not going to read all of the stories, but if you wanted to go back and reread the story of Jacob that we're talking about, those... Uh, chapters 45 through 50 are the chapters that uh, we're referencing. But this morning's text comes from uh, chapter 45, verses 7 and 8, and chapter 50, verse 20. And it reads, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now we're going to jump to Genesis 50 and verse 20. And it reads, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. You see, this is one of my favorite verses right here. 
Because everything, let me tell you this, everything the devil tries to do to destroy you, everything the devil tries to do to upset your ability to walk with God, if you will but trust the Lord, it will not become a stumbling block, but a building block upon which a stronger foundation is built. Though the devil may mean things for evil, God will turn them for good. Many of us might be familiar with the lady up on the screen. Her name is Corey Tenboom. And in this, in, in, in a book that she wrote, she uh, accounts, and the book is The Hiding Place, she accounts of a story where one day she was sick with the flu on, on a specific day when a man came to their small watch shop and he insisted on speaking with her. Corey and her family, they had been sheltering Jews from uh, Hitler and the Nazis. And later she recalled. There's an old Dutch expression. You can tell a man by the way he meets your eyes. And she said, this man seemed to concentrate somewhere between my nose and chin. He never made eye contact with her. And this nervous Dutchman told Corey that he and his wife, uh, that he and his wife had been sheltering Jews as well, but his wife had been arrested and he needed money to bribe a police officer for her release torn about the circumstance and uncertain, but willing to chance turning him away empty-handed, Corey told him to return in half an hour and that she would have the money. But instead of the Dutchman, the Gestapo arrived and raided their house and arrested Corey and her entire family. Later in the work camp prison of uh, Vute, Corey found, all that, uh, found out that the man who had come into their shop that day, uh, the day of the raid, was named Jan Vogel. He had been collaborating with Germans since the occupation, since the beginning of the occupation, day one. And in her book, The Hiding Place, Corey wrote how she was feeling at that particular moment. And these are her words. Flames of fire seemed to leap around that name in my heart. I thought of father's final hours alone and confused in a hospital corridor. Of the underground work so abruptly halted, I thought of Mary Itali arrested while walking down a street. And I knew that if Jan Vogel stood in front of me right now, I could kill him. This man, one of her own countrymen, had betrayed her. He betrayed her father, her brother, her sister and everyone that had been helping spare the Jews. It must have felt impossible to believe anything good can come, could come from such evil circumstances, but the story was not over. You see, as you can see by the picture of Miss Ten Boom on the, on the screen, she didn't pass away in the work camps. But instead, she had the ability to reach out, and she had the ability to spread the word and do some good. With all the evil that had taken place, she had the ability to do some good. Now, this famine that was spreading through the land in the time of Jacob, this famine was, it's what, uh, it's what Joseph had, uh, had interpreted for Pharaoh, what Pharaoh had seen in his dreams. It spread all the way from Egypt, all the way into Canaan, where, where Jacob was, and his, uh, the, the famine began to pinch the food supply from, it, from their family. Crops were failing. Emergency stashes ran low. And before long, they were facing a very real prospect of starvation. But somehow, one would assume from travelers and traders, Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt. There was food. There was, there was a supply somewhere where he could find sustenance. So he sent his ten eldest sons south to buy food for the family. And like a skilled author... At this moment, God was drawing the strands of this story together, slowly weaving them together. Tensions mount for the reader as we see that Joseph and his brothers are on this collision course. What will happen when this power dynamic has been reversed? When Joseph is no longer the one that is in the pit, when Joseph is no longer the one that is looked down upon, but instead he is there saving grace. What's going to happen? See, Joseph, and as far as Egypt was concerned, he was royalty. His brothers, though, they were commoners, but not even commoners. They were strangers, aliens in the land. They did not belong. 
When his brother showed up, it had been 13 years from the moment and the time that his older brothers had thrown him into the well and sold him into slavery. Joseph, you see, he was no longer just the 17-year-old lad. He was a man, and he was in his 30s. He was now in in the prime of his life, and he had reached the pinnacle of what God had called him to do. Where once his brothers had stripped him of his coat of many colors, now he was dressed in the finest linen that Egypt had to offer, and he was decked out with the, with the rubies and the gold and all the pearls and all, all, the, all, all the jewels of Egypt, where once he had cried out to his brothers from the bottom of a pit, now he was standing over them in royal glory. See, they bowed before him, just as his dream had spoken that they would. You see, the thing is, though, They didn't recognize who they bowed before, but he recognized them. See, it was at this moment that Joseph decided to test his brothers. It seemed he he was kind of undecided about what to do. Am I going to help them, or am I going to just send them away with nothing? You see, these are the the men who, who stripped me of my identity. These are the men who stripped me of my blessings, of my calling. These are the men who had everything out against me. And he chose not to reveal his identity to them. Instead, he decided to see if they had changed inwardly over the past 13 years. At first, he accused them of being spies, and he held them in prison for three days. Joseph then sent his brothers on their way, all except for Simeon, whom he bound and put back in prison as a hostage until they brought back their youngest brother, Benjamin. Joseph's younger brother, they returned home with grain for the family, but Jacob refused to even consider sending Benjamin to Egypt because he knew, you know, 13 years ago, I sent sent Joseph out to you boys, and you came back without him. And now Benjamin, my youngest son, my my last son, I'm not trusting him to you guys because also, where's Simeon? You've lost Joseph. You've lost Simeon. I'm not letting you lose Benjamin. And eventually... The grain that they had first purchased, well, like any blessing, like any supplication, it began to run out. And finally, Jacob reluctantly sent them back to Egypt, and he sent their youngest brother, Benjamin, with them. This time, Joseph received them rather differently. Instead of putting them in prison, he freed Simeon, and he took all of them back to his house and ordered his servants to prepare a feast. He began to celebrate them, yet still not revealing who he is. The next day, Joseph sent them on their way, but he told his steward to hide his silver cup in the mouth of Benjamin's grain sack. No sooner had they started on their journey than he sent that very same steward chasing after them and accused them of stealing this cup, accused them of stealing the property of the uh, the royal Egyptian prince, and whomever had stolen it would have to be Joseph's slave. And when it was found in Benjamin's sack, I can imagine the anguish that came upon the other brothers, the other ten. They're looking at this and just, oh, we don't know what to do. And their, their reaction was telling where once they had been willing to, sold, to sell Joseph to be, a, uh, to be a slave, now the very prospect of losing their youngest brother to such a fate was horrifying them. They, lo- they no longer were willing to sell somebody out for their own gain. They tore their clothes, which was a sign of grief and mourning, And they returned back to face Joseph where Judah offered himself to be a slave in the place of Benjamin, pleading, begging for mercy just for the sake of their father. And at this moment, Joseph realized that they truly did have a change of heart. What do you think it was that brought about this change of heart in his brother's lives? What do you think think caused them to to feel different, to think differently. Guilt. That's what I would ascribe it to. I mean, imagine being these these ten young men there out in the fields with their their flocks and they're taking care of everything and here comes their youngest brother and they, they devise this plan to kill him and, you know, Reuben steps up and saves his life. Let's Let's sell him instead. And now they, they sell them off, and here come back these ten. And they lie to their father, Jacob, and say, your, your son's dead. 
And imagine the, the guilt and the blame and the shame that Jacob put upon those ten, those ten boys. Don't you realize he was your youngest brother? See, in, in my house, I'm constantly teaching my boys that, you know, siblings, any, anybody who's had siblings or has children, multiple children, you understand that siblings don't always get along. And that's okay. They don't have to. But the thing that I constantly teach my boys is whether you and your brothers always get along, it is up to you to protect your brother from anybody and every. I don't care what is going on. You protect your brother. And Levi's catching the most of this right now because, you know, although he's the middle child, and Nathaniel's autistic, he doesn't completely understand the concept. And so Levi being, uh, being the most neurotypical, he understands that, you know, somebody could easily take advantage of Nate. And Owen, he just trusts absolutely everybody for no reason. Owen loves the world, and the world loves Owen. And unfortunately, that makes him pretty vulnerable as well. And so Levi knows that it's my job to protect my brothers. Owen knows it's my job to protect my brothers. And I can imagine, you know, these, these ten boys come back, and Jacob's saying, I thought you knew it was your job to protect your brothers. And now your littlest brother is gone. The most vulnerable of all of you. You see, Jacob favored Joseph. That was his favorite son. Not that, not that I condone favoritism or anything like that, but that was his favorite son. And now these ten come back and daddy's little boy is gone. I'm sure he didn't take it easy on them. Got to remember, this is also the, the, the time and the culture where the Word of God was written that if a, if a child is being disobedient, this is actually a couple hundred years later, if a child is being disobedient and rebellious to their parents, you take them outside of the city and you kill them. That's in the Word of God, just in case you didn't know that. This is the culture. And so I can imagine, Jacob didn't take it easy on his sons. And some might think it was cruel of Joseph to play these kind of mind games on his brothers after, after their change of heart and uh, testing them to see if they had truly changed. And it's an interesting what-if scenario to wonder what Joseph would have done if it had turned out that the brothers had not changed in the last 13 years. But just as Joseph put his brothers through the test, he too had been tested and tried. You see, Joseph was no longer the naive teenager that he once was. He was no longer the one who delighted in bragging to his brothers, his mother, and his, his father about his dreams, about him being exalted and elevated above everybody else. He had been thrown into the pit. He had survived the slave march into Egypt. He had risen and fallen in Potiphar's house. He had languished in prison, and he ascended to the palace ultimately. And even at this moment with his brothers completely within his power, Joseph was still being tested. He had changed through through all he had been, and had he changed through all he had been, and if he had, had it been for the better? Why do you think Joseph had to go through all of these tests in life? Why do you think that Joseph had to be sold into slavery and then accused of, uh, of uh, taking advantage of his master's wife and then thrown into prison? Why, why, would God, why would God intend something like that? Isn't God a God of love? That's what we like to say today. God is a God of love. Absolutely. I agree with that. God is a God of love. But God is also a God of logic. You see, this 17-year-old boy, had he risen to a place of royalty, and had he been placed under Pharaoh just like he was without any of that, imagine how haughty he would have been. So often we look at our lives, and I, I, I can at least speak for myself, but I'm sure I can, uh, I can attest for most other people in here. We look at our lives and we say, God, why? Anybody else pray that? Just that simple two-word prayer. God, why? And you know, the times I've prayed that, I've been sitting here in this sanctuary at home in my own prayer closet, just, God, I, I don't even know what to say to you right now. Just why? 
Seriously, God, why? And I just sit there, and I'm expecting this loud, thunderous voice. It's the Father. You know, he, he takes the role of Father at that point in time, and he begins to speak to me. This is, this is why I said, but does that happen? Absolutely not. Instead, when I'm sitting there crying, why, God? Why has my life been the way it's been? I feel the warm embrace of the Holy Spirit just surround me. I begin to break down and my two-word prayer goes into a language that I don't even know. As the Holy Ghost just falls upon me. And then in that still, small voice that Elijah described. Because this is where you belong. See, God is not, when we go through difficulties and tests and trials, God's not trying to destroy us. He's trying to mold us. See, I, I've, I've heard it preached and taught over the years, and I agree with the premise entirely that those of us who, who, uh, who grab a hold of who we are and say, this is, this is the way things need to be, and I, I'm going to be just... And, and we form our lives to the way we want them to be. Can I tell you something? Can God use you? Absolutely. God can use anything. He spoke to Balaam through a donkey. If he can speak through a, a donkey, he can speak through you. Most of you. Teasing. <laughs> Brother Granger's like, why are you looking back here at me, bro? Well, actually, I, I was looking somewhere else trying to find a mirror so I can... No, I'm kidding. But, but if God can speak through a donkey, he can, he can speak through anybody in the most ridiculous state and condition you find yourselves in. I, full, I wholeheartedly believe that. But you will also find that the ones that God has allowed, that have allowed God to grind them down and break them down and com be completely broken and surrendered to God, they're the ones that God can use the most powerfully. They're the ones that can speak with the, with the authority and power of God uninhibited. Why? Because I have nothing to hold me back. I've already lost it for the sake of God anyways. So God, let's go and let's do this. They have a boldness that rises up within them. Why? Because I have nothing left to lose. When we ask God why, we must understand that He has intention to, to, to mold us and form us into the very thing that we should be. And so after all of the trial, after all of the testing, after everything that Joseph has been through, and now that he's put his brothers through, Joseph finally decides to reveal his identity and you know what? His brothers, they were first amazed. Then I can imagine the fear, the panic that set upon them. Imagine being Judah. If I recall the story correctly, you scholars in here correct me if I'm wrong, but imagine being Judah. If I recall the story correctly, he's the one that said, hey, let's kill him. Reuben defended him. But if I remember right, Judah's like, let's kill him. I want nothing to do with him. And now Judah stands before his brother knowing it was my plan. I'm the eldest. I'm the one ultimately, ultimately responsible for everything that happened to you. And now you've got ultimate authority over me. I, can, I, I just I can't imagine the panic through this young man's, through, through, well, he wasn't young at that time. His brother's in his 30s. He's probably in his 40s or 50s. I can't imagine the panic going through Judah's mind or the other's. But Judah's instead, instead of being afraid of what might happen, Judah's offering himself for his youngest brother. Imagine, if you would, if you were one of them, one of those brothers, how would you feel? I can tell you, me, for one, I... I don't like conflict. Anybody that knows me knows that I don't like conflict. And I actually have this physiological reaction to, uh, to conflict where I almost get sick to my stomach. If I feel like I'm about to enter into a, a tense situation, I've got to talk myself down from running to the bathroom and throwing up if I, if I know it's coming. That's just the way I hate conflict. One might say that I'm in the wrong profession if I hate conflict, and maybe you're right, but this is where God called me to be. So take it up with God. But I can imagine, you know, if I was 
Judah or Reuben or any of these brothers that, that sold my brother into slavery, and all of a sudden I recognize this is Joseph, I would lose my ever-loving mind. What's going to happen to me now? I, I, I don't even know what to do. I don't. Great, my, my life is lost. I, I, I don't know where to go. I don't know. You see, this is, this is where they were. Joseph, you, you see, they, uh, Joseph sees that they had a change of heart, but they don't know how the years have changed him. They were probably expecting the sword to fall upon their necks. Dumbfounded, completely lost in what was going on. They couldn't even reply to this question. They were simply troubled at the presence of their brother. And God sent Joseph to, before them to preserve them. In Genesis 45, verses 4 and 5 records, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Notice Joseph's approach to his brothers. He reveals, I am Joseph, your brother, and you sold me into slavery. And the very next sentence is, don't be afraid or angry with yourself. Don't worry about what you've done in your past, because God had a plan. You know, if I could speak, and those of you who have been here for a few years, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If I could speak to some people who weren't here, who aren't here right now, I would would stand here and say, don't worry about what happened. Why? Because God had a purpose. It was necessary for God's glory to be had. So I praise the Lord for every turmoil, for every trial. Did I enjoy them? Absolutely not. But I thank my God that he gave me the strength and the fortitude to withstand because now, let me tell you, church, now this church is where we need to be. Now this church is is geared and set up for revival. I was just talking to Sister Granger before service. It will not be long before we see such an influx of people that we can't even keep up with Bible studies. We can't keep up with baptisms. I'm going to need some people to start baptizing them in Jesus' name. Why? Because I can't do it. I'm telling you, church, revival is on its way. And it all had to come through that route. So anybody who watches this online right now, wherever you are, whatever you've done, don't worry about the past because it just fulfilled the will of God. And I praise God for everything that has occurred. I praise God. You see, Joseph, he first off, he prayed that they would come near to him. He wasn't demanding. He requested gentle and kind. Many hard conflicts could be resolved peacefully if you see we would just follow this example. So often, we are faced with conflict and we forget all about the Word of God. What are you talking about, Brother Mike? I never forget about the Word of God. I never forget there's one God. I never forget of Jesus' name, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but have you forgotten about the proverb that says, a soft answer turns away wrath? How many of us rise up and take up arms when somebody begins to attack us? I'm one of them. I'm not going to deny it. But I, let me tell you, if somebody would get a hold of the mindset that a soft answer will turn away the wrath, let me tell you, this church is going to fill up a whole lot faster. Oh, Brother Mike, you're talking about compromising and, and not telling people to live for God. I absolutely am not. I'll preach at hellfire and brimstone however I have to. But let me tell you something. The moment you begin to ridicule somebody, the moment you begin to take up arms with somebody you don't agree with, the moment that you begin to argue and bicker and backbite among you, it's the moment at which you poison the church. You see... Everything you've been through in your life up until this point, I can assure you, has been orchestrated by God. Everything. Brother Mike, what about my past where, you know, all the wrong things I did? Are you telling me that God intended me to do wrong? No, God never intended you to do wrong. But he orchestrated everything so that even though you did do wrong, he would come out on top. 
He orchestrated everything so that even though wrong was done against you, he would come out on top. He orchestrated everything so that even though everything works against you, an anointing will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will begin to prophesy. And you will begin to lay hands on the sick. And you will begin to pray people through to the Holy I'm not talking about in the house of God. I'm talking about in the streets. I'm talking about in Walmart. I'm talking about a Bible study. Because my friend, that's where the church belongs. The church doesn't belong just in four walls. The church belongs in the world. You see, the word of God says that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to be a lifeboat wherein people find salvation. And this is what Joseph became to his brothers. You see, rather than Joseph getting hung up on harming his brothers or all the harm that they had done, rather, Joseph willingly forgave them. He forgave them for what they had done, and he focused on what the good was that God had brought from it. You see, this kind of conflict resolution, that can only be orchestrated by God. As the English poet Alexander Poe once wrote, to err is human, but to forgive is divine. Without God, Joseph would have likely executed a fearful revenge upon his brothers for what they had done. Slavery, torture, death, you name it, it was all within his power. He had the authority to demand anything that's upon anybody who stood within Egypt. But instead, Joseph chose to forgive. You see, I've told the story of when I, when I knelt down to pray with my son. And he began asking me, why isn't this person at church anymore? Why don't we see this person? And my heart broke. I believe this was about this time last year, now that I think about it. Sounds right. Levi was asking me about all of these people, and I didn't know what to say. I was angry. I was hurt. I was bitter. You see, at that moment, I had a decision to make, and you guys know the story. I'm not going to tarry here long. I decided at that moment, I have to forgive. Now, the moment at which I forgave, and I, I, I began to explain to my son that God was doing a work that we didn't see, that we didn't understand, and God sent these people to go, to go where, where he needed them to be. That, that was an act of forgiveness. But let me tell you something. That single act of forgiveness wasn't enough. Because, you see, forgiveness is not something that you, it's not a one and done. It's a perpetual lifestyle. Meaning, I can't just look at these individuals that may have hurt me or, or somebody who's done me wrong and just look at them and say, I forgive you and walk off and be done with it. I have to make sure that I keep myself in check and every single time I see them, I don't let bitterness and anger rise back up within me. Instead, I let the Holy Spirit and the peace, the, the peace that passes all understanding, the joy that's unspeakable, I let those things rise up. I let the fruit of the Spirit take control, not the fruit of the flesh, the, the anger and the hatred and the bitterness and the angst. Instead, I let the love, the joy, the peace, the long sufferings, the gentleness. See, forgiveness is a perpetual decision. Something you must choose to do every single day. And I've encountered some of these people that I've forgiven last year. And I've encountered them a few times since then. And uh, I've talked to Brother Martin about it because he and I talk very closely about a lot of these things. And I've told him, you know, Brother Martin's one of those guys. He, he does not mind conflict. If it's what needs to be done, he, he doesn't care. Am I right, Brother Martin? If, it, if it's what's right, he'll, he'll, he'll fight the biggest devil and the biggest dude. It doesn't, doesn't matter to him. Me, I hate conflict. Oh, I can't stand it. And these moments when I, I've encountered some of these individuals again, I, I get that sick feeling that I described to you earlier. It begins to rise up and I get angry. I think about conversations I've had or possible conversations I could have in the future, and I let myself start getting angry. And You see, I have to get myself, my heart, my mind, my spirit in check in those moments. Because when, though I forgave them at that moment when I prayed with my son, it's not enough to then take up that mantle of anger and hatred and bitterness again. It's not, I can't do that. 
See, one of my, you know, every, every single one of these lessons, they provide us a video. And oftentimes I know the individual speaking in the video. But this morning, uh, the, the person in the video, he's actually one of my favorite professors at Urshan. It's Brother Cullen Cressman. And he shares a little bit of his backstory and what his mom and dad taught him and what uh, his mother-in-law has taught him, but about conflict resolution and forgiveness. And just watch and, and hear what he's got to say. In life, I learned, as everybody else will, that conflict happens even if you have the best intentions. You are always going to, because you are a different individual than others, you are going to run into conflict. Now, something I was blessed to have in life was good parents. And they have taught me, they continue to teach me that one of the keys to conflict is communication. So one of the things that I like to think of just in general, apply to every relationship, a working relationship, a spouse, a relative, a dear friend, even an enemy. Anytime that there's some kind of conflict, you have two options. You can either communicate again or never communicate again. You will always be faced whenever there's conflict with those two options. Now you may decide, I'm not gonna talk to him again. And you separate, there's no growth there. You always have to make the decision, I'm gonna talk again. Most conflict comes from misunderstanding. It could be misunderstanding of words that you use. It can also be a misunderstanding of perspective. Maybe somebody misjudged your motives. It's always good to just go talk again. Maybe you had a meeting with somebody and it didn't go the way that you thought. Set up a second meeting. Maybe you tried to have a conversation with your spouse. It didn't go the way that you thought that it should go or maybe things are tense now. Go talk again. The number one key to communication is to keep communicating. Clarify what, what was misunderstood. Let me use different words. Don't let me be aggressive in defending my position so much that I don't see that there's two humans, two sides. My mother-in-law likes to say there's three sides to every story. My side, their side, and the truth. Always remember that in conflict is that I'm going to communicate in efforts to understand the truth. I wanna see their side, my side, and I'm gonna keep on talking, keep on communicating, because the only other option is to not communicate. The only other option I have is to just separate. The only way to handle conflict is to talk again. See, although conflict had riddled this family, Joseph then sent for his father and for his brothers and his he sent for the rest of his family. Five years of famine were still to come. Trekking back and forth between Canaan and Egypt for food was not a reliable long-term plan for, uh, for Jacob's family. So instead, Joseph sent his brothers home with food, wagons, and provisions, everything they needed to bring their father back with them and bring their entire family into Egypt. Because, you see, here's the thing about it. We find that God's plans are greater than our plans. <coughs> we find that His ways are higher than our ways. And no matter what predicament we find ourselves in, if we will but rely upon God, we'll recognize the provision He brought for us. You see, in Canaan, there was no provision for the famine. All of the provision was provided in Egypt. See, God has a plan for your life. And he's taking every pit that you've been through, every mile you've been dragged in chains, every day of hard labor, every trial, every trouble, every false accusation, every day in prison, or every year you have spent just being forgotten. And He's taking all of those and He's sewing them all together, weaving them together. Because when the timing is perfect... In the course of just one single day, you will go from the prison to the palace. You see, it doesn't take God long to bring His will to fruition when He says it's time. I look at this sanctuary this morning, and uh, my, my wife has told me to stop 
to stop thinking about these things. But this morning, it's a different perspective. As we sit in here right now, not including myself, there's nine adults. Now, I understand there are some that are missing this morning, sickness and traveling, all kinds of other things. Um, there are nine adults in my adult Sunday school class. And I can look in this sanctuary that is seat that, that has capacity for 120 to 150, and I can be absolutely distraught. And I have been in the past. I can look at the sanctuary and say, but God, how can we bring about revival? Right now, in my mind's eye, I look at us, I can't see how God's going to fill this place. But I know that he will. And in fact, I know that it will be in a short time frame in which he will do it. Right now, there might be nine people in this room, but I would, I, I would bear to say that by the end of this year, we'll probably have 40 people in this room. By the end of next year, we won't even fit in this room. I'm telling you, church, it does not take God a long time to take you from the lowest of lows and place you upon the highest of highs. All you have to do is trust that God's plans are higher than yours. You see, at this moment in time, Pharaoh let Joseph's family go live in Goshen. His brothers returned with their father Jacob with this incredible news. And not only was Joseph alive, but he's second in command in Egypt. And at first, Jacob, I'm sure he didn't believe, you boys are just lying to me. But then when he saw all of the provisions that his son had sent him, you see, that was proof enough. I live <laughs> I'm sure I'm not talking to anybody in here, but I'm going to address it nevertheless. I'm sure there has been or are some people sometimes that look at this and say, but Brother Mike, you keep preaching about revival and we've not seen it yet. Why aren't these pews full? Well, go ahead and keep disbelieving, keep doubting, because that moment when the wagons start rolling up, that moment when provision starts rolling in, then you'll understand that God has sent forth his messenger to say provision is coming, revival is coming. And let me tell you, first anointing, the time, is now. Revival is here now. All we have to do is say, but Lord, pour it out. Provision was the way by which Jacob knew that his son was alive. Near the end, at the end of his life, while still in Egypt, the day came for Jacob to die, and he began to bless Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Then Jacob gathered the rest of his children around his bed, the rest of his sons around his bed, and he prophesied over them and began to bless them. And when Jacob died, Joseph had him embalmed in Egypt, as was, as was the tradition in Egypt. And all of Jacob's sons traveled back to Canaan to bury him in the, case, in the cave of uh, Machpelah alongside Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah, and even Jacob's very own wife, Leah. Because you see, after their father's death, Joseph's brothers feared Joseph would finally take revenge on them. The brothers sent a messenger to Joseph saying that Jacob wanted him to forgive them. And they, they came themselves and fell down before Joseph and said, Behold, we are your servants, Genesis 50 and 18. You see, vengeance, he was so far from Joseph's mind that Joseph actually broke down in tears. He told his brothers in verses 19, and 19 through 21, Fear not, for, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you sought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Therefore, fear not. I will nourish you and your little ones. I don't know why God has been placing it upon me like this this morning, but I know I'm teaching fresh anointing here, but I'm also talking to somebody online. I don't usually do this. But I feel it in my spirit. I'm talking to somebody who's watching online right now. You feel like you can't come back. You feel like you won't be accepted. You won't be welcomed. But let me tell you, 
There's nothing but forgiveness here. There's mercy here. There's love here. For to take the words of Jacob, uh, I'm sorry, of Joseph, am I to be in the place of God to choose not to forgive? No. But here you'll find love. You'll find peace. You'll find nourishment. Because that which was meant for evil, that which was meant to destroy, God intended to build up. See, I, we all need to make this proclamation that I will surrender my past to God and allow Him to make something beautiful out of my brokenness. Every single one of us have experienced brokenness of some sort. I look across here, there's a number of us that have been raised in church and many of us who have not been. Whether you've had the Holy Ghost since you were six or since you were 16 or 60, you experience brokenness, I'm sure of it. Because brokenness is part of being human. It comes from our fallen nature, from the consequences of sin and our own perfections. But you see, brokenness, that is not the end. Brokenness just gives God an opportunity to flow in our lives where he picks up the shattered pottery pieces, submerges us in his spirit once again, to make us soft, to make something beautiful out of our broken and destroyed lives. So what? Your life has been hard and you've been broken. I don't say that not caring. I say that with fully caring. But so what? Because it is in that brokenness that God can create something beautiful. Amen. Well, it is 11 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and break for a few minutes as we get ready for worship service. Those who are watching online will be back online about 11.05 to start worship. And I hope you join us, and we will see you then. God bless.